Hey everyone, so today we're taking the alpine stars that you saw in a previous video from this state to this after paint and a whole bunch of polishing and then we're going to take it for a ride and then we're going to turn it into this so I've done another video on this bike but if you haven't seen it before it's an old alpine stars Almega DX with a few changes like it's got thummies and this stem adapter it's basically just a cut down quill stem so I can use an A head or threadless stem on it. Comes with the DX components. It doesn't have all the factory stuff because my friend found it like unstock. I think it was just a frame and fork. So it's an alloy frame and it comes with the steel fork from factory. Quite a nice straight fork on it. It looks quite nice. It's quite tatty. <laughs> I do quite like the, the beaten up boussage look of it. But today we're going to be repainting it because I think it, it's quite a cool bike so it sort of deserves like the bit of love it's gonna get so just stripping it all down it's still dirty from the retro ride that I did a few weeks ago but because it hasn't been together for too long it comes apart really easily so repainting it um, I'm gonna be using spray dot bike I painted my specialized hard rock that's painted like a stump jumper I painted that up last year and it's been holding up really well and that's like my commuter bike so I've been like smashing it up leaning it up against things and stuff and it's held up quite well there are a few paint chips and stuff but I mean that would probably happen with <laughs> the, the regular abuse anyway so I'm going to be painting it not the same blue but I'll be painting it sort of the Chromega color so I think it's the Chromega LX um, I don't actually know if it's pink or if it's orange, it's hard to tell because some photos it looks different and then some photos it looks red as well. But I really want it neon or fluoro pink. So it does look quite similar in photos, but um, that's just what I'm going with. And then the center section of the bike will be polished. Because it's an alloy frame, I can strip it down and then polish it up or sand it up and then polish it from there. And it looks really nice. Um, I've polished a couple of bikes before, I'm really happy with the result, but I think the neon to polish looks really good, um, and then I think I'm going to do a bit of yellow somewhere. Before I started, I didn't know if I was going to do like a bit of um, like a neon yellow splatter on some of it, or use yellow to separate the colours, um, but you'll sort of see what I do later on. So most of the componentry will stay the Dior DX. Like pretty well stock. Um, I do have some different components and like little bits and bobs that are there on the bike, but it already has the nice Polestar wheels on it. I put I put those on in the last video. I gave them a, a service and everything, so they're all good to go. I just got to give them another clean, get all the mud off them. So this little cable guide, I didn't take it off last time, so I had to shave down an Allen key to fit. I don't know what size it was or if just the rust sort of built up. So I couldn't fit a regular Allen key in there. Moving on to paint stripping now. I just use a paint stripper gel, which you basically just brush on. Um, you can get someone to media blast it if you want. There's lots of professionals around that can do this sort of thing. So the way I do it is I basically just scuff it up with the sandpaper. That seems to help it quite a lot. Then you just brush it on and let it activate for a bit. It takes about 10, 15 minutes or so and it softens up quite a bit, softens up, sorry, and then you can scrape it off. Um, if you're going to be polishing it, try not to use a paint scraper or like a razor blade on the last coat, but um, it really helps on the top, top coat. There are some little bits left over, I just use a Dremel like in the welds and stuff, and then going up like close to the, what do you call them, like the little cable stops, but yeah, so Using the scotch bike pads, you get along the welds pretty nicely. So I start with the red scotch bike pad, then go to the grey one, and then work my way up to about a 2000 2500 grit sandpaper. Just wet sanding my way. It takes a long time, so I'm not going to show the whole process, but make sure you're pretty comfy. Yeah, I'm sort of showing. Um, it's not always easy to get the same sanding direction, so just try and even it out like at the end of sanding with that grit before you move on to the next one. So this normally takes quite a long time, but I normally split it up over 
two or three days or so, just so I'm not polishing like the whole day. So before I get to the finest sandpaper, I normally do a bit of a test pass, sort of about midway through polishing. So this time I did this junction here. This just gives me like a bit of reassurance that I'm on the right path and I didn't mess up anywhere. But after you finish the finest sandpaper, I use Autosol. It's basically just like a rub on, rub off polishing compound. So this step is we start to see a really big improvement. So it's a big jump from the sanding before to Autosol. So it'll look really good after the Autosol. From here, I normally do another finer polishing compound, which is called Brasso. It's more of a liquid and it just gets like the little finer scratches out a bit more. Um, I use a finer rag as well. And then I just seal it up with wax. You can clear coat it as well, but um, I prefer to just wax it and then repolish as necessary. It's been working good for me for components and stuff, so that's just the way I like it. Uh, from here, I just use some metal primer, prime up the parts that I want painted, and then I'm going to be using the fluoro pink from Spray Dot Bite. So this is the hard jumper. I call it, it's a hard rock that's painted like a stump jumper. Um, so the seat tube is normally where I put the U-lock through, and as you can see there, there's no real scratches on it. So basically, you just want to make sure that you're at the right distance and that the nozzle doesn't um, clog up with any paint or anything like that. And then just chuck it on. It's a really nice product to use as long as you paint at the right sort of distance. Just do some test passes on like some like a test frame or something like that if you have one kicking around. But it came out really good. I tried to use one of the neon colors another time and it sort of powdered a little bit more. Um, but this time it worked really good. So I am wet sanding between coats. You don't really need multiple coats with this paint because it goes on so vividly. And here I'm just using um, a bit of water so I can see where I've sanded and where I haven't. It seems to work really good for me. I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but it works for me. Um, so you can see there, after I've sanded it, the water runs smooth. So to get this yellow effect, I did the same sort of style as I did on the GT Force. It's basically just scrunched up cling film, dipped in paint, and then sort of dabbed on the bike. Moving on to the decals now. These decals were from Retro Decals in the UK by Gil, I believe his name is. He's done quite a few different decals and stuff, and Johnny of uh, Sydney Retro Mountain Bikes. Um, recommend him <laughs> with great regards. So thanks, Johnny. The decals look amazing, so I'm really happy with them. Really easy to put on as well. They're not water slides like I've done in the past, so they're a bit more regular. So they seem to adhere really well. Uh, these are a custom colorway, so Guild does do like adjustments if you want to. So if you're after some decals, I highly recommend checking out Retro Decals. Good looking decal in the pink. That looks so good. <laughs> so after the decals were on, I did put about three coats of clear gloss over the top just over the parts that were on the painted sections so back to the componentry now a lot of this did need cleaning up because when i built the bike up previously i didn't really go through and polish everything i just sort of adjusted things and put it together quite quickly so things like the handlebars that i put on the bike the cranks the brakes even the derailleurs needed cleaning up and polishing this derailleur I did actually clean before the rides that I did last time, but just because of the mud and some of the plant life and stuff that I rode through, it got stuck in. So I did mock the cranks up with some chain rings and a bottom bracket before filming this. So I just had the cranks with the chain rings just lightly on. That was just to check that I had the right width bottom bracket. So I just clean the cranks up. I just do like a bit of a quick job. So I clean the cranks off with some soapy water first. And this time I'm going to be masking the factory writing on the crank and polishing around it. I don't normally do this, but I see like when other people polish cranks, 
they just polish over it. And then someone always comments and says, why did you remove the writing? <laughs> and it's for good reason. It's not really worth it. It's probably best just to polish the entire thing, take the writing off and everything, and then just get a new sticker for it. Because you always end up with like this sort of funny looking <laughs> haze around the writing. Because if you polish over it, it's just going to be removed anyway. So you can't make it look even and nice. But just for the sake of it, I decided to mask it up just to sh sort of show people. Um, you can make it look okay, but it's definitely not perfect. So the quick version of polishing cranks, it's just um, yeah, cleaning it up and then using the two scotch bite pads and then auto -sol. This is a pretty quick method to give a pretty good result. Um, it's certainly not perfect, but the cranks are going to get scratched up anyway. And I'll show you here two different methods. So this first one is no clear coat, just wax. And then the second one will be clear coated. Um, but as you can see here, it gets all scratched up. Paint chips look awful. And then um, your shoes actually <laughs> like tear the clear coat off because clear coat doesn't really adhere to polished parts that well. Also, clear coating seems to dull the polished look by a little bit too. So after the autosole, I use Brasso and a jewellery polishing rag. It seems to be one of the softer materials that I've used. It tends to get out the finer scratches that autosole like, and microfiber rags and stuff leave behind. So you can see here, it's quite a nice finish afterwards. So this is the finished result. You can sort of see a bit of a haze around the lettering here. So after the auto sole, I do go over it with Brasso, and then I just rub straight over the lettering. And that takes off a bit of it, but it's definitely not perfect. So the brakes that we'll be using on the bike look pretty filthy. So they need a really good clean up. Uh, the brake pads need a good clean as well. I think some of the bolts need sitting in a Vaporost overnight but not these back ones, which is kind of strange. Um, they actually look new, I don't... interesting. But yeah, just pulling everything apart now, and then giving it a clean with some soapy water. I suppose you could put these in an ultrasonic cleaner, but I don't know how well the plastic would hold up, because those little um, emblems are just glued on, so you might have to <laughs> stick one of those back on or something. But yeah, I just use a toothbrush and soapy water. Pretty old school method, but it does a pretty good job. I just use the Dremel for this. It's pretty good at getting in like all the tiny little grooves and stuff. You can also use a bench grinder with the polishing wheel attached. Or you can hand polish with a rag as well. You normally have to remove the polish residue with the rag anyway. So this is the finished result. I don't go too hardcore on brakes. They get quite a bit of mud and stuff built up on them anyway. So I sort of tried to balance like time of polishing this the end result and also like longevity of it so how i'm going to be using the bike and those sort of factors play into it so i've got a pile of parts that need to go into the vapor rust it's a pretty small pile really just a few things like some little nuts and bolts from brake parts and a couple of things from the derailleurs just little nuts and stuff i think this jockey wheel needs replacing <laughs> it's pretty sharp teeth on it this cable ankle nut I keep saying ankle nut. This cable anchor nut will go into the Vaporust too. So after the Vaporust, you just give it a bit of a wipe off. And then you can either clear coat it or coat it with some oil or something to prevent it from rusting again. Um, I normally just clear coat stuff. I've got like a can of it kicking around. There's something so satisfying about cleaning jockey wheels. I don't know what it is. I don't even need to clean this one. Because this is the one that's going to be replaced, but... It's just so satisfying. So inside of the derailleur body, it's got a bit of dirt in it. I'm pretty sure I cleaned this the last time I put it on. But um, yeah, a bit of WD-40 and stuff just cleans it up. Doesn't need like a soaking or anything like that. So the center part of the derailleur, it is painted, but the outer two pieces are alloy, so you can polish those up. Just give them a little bit of a clean up with the Dremel. I don't polish this up too much, but it's a quite a nice improvement. So replacing the jockey wheels now, 
I found one sitting around that will replace this old worn out shark tooth looking one. At first I thought these were rusty, but it turns out it's just some grease. So I just shoved an Allen key in a rag and cleaned it out. Just to make sure that it was actually grease. Clean the inside of the pulley wheel uh, bushing plates. This is also really satisfying. So I've read sort of both ways. Um, some people recommend to not grease or oil the jockey wheels. Other people do. Um, I think maintenance with grease is, or like a light grease, is probably the best way, in my opinion. So I just use this white lithium grease. It's it's quite thin. It almost basically feels like a, an oil, but it's quite resilient to wear and stuff. It's quite waterproof. So this is the thing that I use. Although some people use no grease and then other people use like quite heavy grease, so just sort of experiment and see what you like. So every now and then someone refers to my gloves. Um, I just prefer to rock them this way. So little things like this are just easier with that little bit of extra finger feel. So putting on some bolts and stuff. But specifically for me, I'm filming. So I use my phone to film stuff. So using the touch screen, I obviously need my fingers. It just makes life a bit easier. And then I don't have to clean like my entire hand. I can just clean like my fingertips. So this is the evaporized. The parts were soaking in it for about a day or so. And the phone was soaking in it for about half a second. <laughs> but luckily the phone's waterproof, so I haven't had any issues with it really. So just pulling all the parts out now. And then moving on to the headset. So I do use an unsealed uh, loose ball situation in this headset. So this headset was off for Gary Fisher. A mate called Paul gave this to me. So thanks Paul for the headset. So in order to keep this kind of strange headset size going a bit longer, I decided to use loose bearings. So because it's a pretty strange one and a quarter headset size, I would probably have to get something from overseas to replace it. So it's just, it works out better for like long term if I just throw some loose balls in it, then I don't have to worry about it until I go to service it and then all the balls fall out. But the grease should hold them all in there anyway. But yeah, loose ball headsets tend to last longer than caged ones. They're a little bit harder to service because you have to replace all the balls individually. But for long term, they're better. So it seems anyway. So adjusting the headset now to make sure it all it's not too tight and not too loose and everything. It does look quite nice. It's alloy as well, so I could polish it up to match the other components. But I wanted to keep it pretty dull. So I just used the grey scotch pad and then some auto sole over it. Putting in the stem converter and stem now. I think I said it earlier, but this is basically just a quill stem cut down so that I can use a threadless or a head stem on it. I think Old Shovel actually did this on a previous video, but I've used one on my Cannondale because it's the same one and a quarter headset size and it's been working great for me. You can only do this with the one and a quarter stems because the one and a quarter outside diameter is the same as the inside diameter of the A head stem. So they just match up perfectly. So you basically just cut like the extension part off, file it down a little bit so it's nice and smooth, and then you can bolt on your A head stem. So throwing on the bars now, these are I quite like these bars. These are a Salsa Moto Ace bar. I think there's 17 degree version. They came in a 12 degree version as well, I think. These were originally black, but the previous owner polished them up. So they look quite nice on old retro bikes and stuff. And they've got just a subtle amount of back sweep that makes them comfortable, but not 
super cruisy looking, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So I think Michelle had a bit of a hard time getting the bottom bracket out when he found the bike. So just putting some grease in like I would normally on a steel frame, but this is alloy, so probably less likely to happen, but can still get stuck in there. So using the UN300 bottom bracket, it did come with some Loctite on the adjustable cup for the non-drive side. So I just ground a bit of that off with the Dremel. It would prevent from oxidization and stuff, but so does grease. I just I feel a bit better about using grease instead of Loctite um, to keep the bottom bracket in there. So one of the things I didn't like about the Alpine Stars when I had it built up was the gearing. So the small ring on it that was on it before was a 28 tooth. So we're dropping down to a 24 tooth just to make climbing up some of the steep hills a little bit easier. So the cog out the back is just a 28 tooth as well. So it was really just a one-to-one -one low gear, which it's pretty low, but um, it certainly had lower. So 24 to 28 should give a nice uh, decrease or increase in range. So we'll be keeping the triple ring set up. I think it looks quite classic and also it gives a pretty good gearing range. So we can go all the way up to, I think it's a 46 tooth big chain ring. The middle is a 34, I believe. So pretty good range, going from the 28 up to the 46. Most of my one by systems are 38 or a 36 tooth. I try and keep a 38 because it gives like a nice top end. And then 11 to 42 for commuting bikes. But that sort of varies quite a lot depending on the terrain and the riding and how loaded your bike is going to be. So just keep that in mind. Um, some people go for quite a, quite a bit smaller gear. Some people will even go up to like the 50, 50 something tooth if they're in quite flat environments too. I really like the way th these cranks look now. Yeah, really happy with the cranks. It gives like a nice bit of a contrast to the matte chain rings as well when you have polished cranks. So that was just a little bit of that white lithium grease just to prevent the bolts from rusting there. Because those caps aren't watertight, obviously they have holes in them. So water's gonna get in and they do tend to rust eventually. So one of the derailleur hanger screws had a bit of a damaged thread at the end. I think what happened was the chain got sort of stuck between the cassette and this screw, and it sort of damaged the end of the thread. It came out, but it didn't want to screw back in. So I have this other screw, the one on the left there that's all fugly. It's not countersunk, so it didn't fit in properly. So I have to sort of file that down or just get a countersunk screw that'll fit in there. So just putting on the ties now, I'm using a Paneracer Dart on the front and a Paneracer Smoke on the rear. This is a pretty classic combination. I didn't buy these tires specifically, I picked them up off a bike that I bought. So I'll be using these as a part of the like classic or the stock build. And then later on in the video we'll be swapping to Schwab Billy Bonkers. It's my first time trying these tires but I've heard really good things about them. So I look forward to testing them out. But for now, we're just using these pan erasers. They sort of suit like the era and the look I'm going for. For I guess you'd call it version 2.0. It was already version 1.0 in the last video. And here we're sort of skipping to version 2 and then version 3 at the end of the video. So this little cable hanger 
because it had paint on it previously on the seat tube, it was a slightly different thickness. So I had to use a little shim cut from a can to bulk it up because it didn't quite have enough given it to make up the difference. But after that, it bolted up really nicely. So just throwing the rear brake on now. This is an old Flybikes cable hanger from like a BMX U brake. So some of the parts are like interchangeable. Quite a nice little piece. It would be cooler if it was sort of faded to pink. One of the things, apparently it's a bit of an upgrade. Some people use gear cables as straddle cables. They have a bit more flex to them, so they sort of follow a more direct route compared to a thicker brake cable. So you can buy these little brass cable ends. They don't really have a specific name, but I found these and they work really good. So you give like quite a nice lever feel when accompanied with like the nice brake pads and then like a linear or BMX compressionless brake cable. Yeah, I tend to use BMX cables because they're cheaper than like the Jaguar Pro cables, unless you buy like a big reel of it. But also BMX cables tend to come in like all sorts of crazy colors as well. So you can really get pretty, pretty crazy with the color customization on bikes. And then yeah, just going for like a 90 degree straddle cable. So you basically just adjust the cable hanger height and then shorten the straddle cable. You want it about 90 degrees where the pads contact the rim. That's a pretty general rule for most old Shimano cantilever brakes, so you can do nice skids. But it doesn't apply to all brakes. Some need them a little bit higher, some don't really care. But if your cantilever brakes aren't performing too well, then straddle cable is definitely something like worth looking into. That and just some good brake pads with a little bit of toe in can really, yeah, really improve your brakes. So just throwing the chain on now. It's just a brand new chain. Um, you always run the risk of whether the chain rings are gonna just slip the chain or not, but lucky for me, these ones don't. They're in pretty good condition, but you just never really know until you get a new chain on it. So about the only problem I have with thummies, I really like their action, their position and everything, but sometimes putting the cable in is kind of a pain until you take the barrel adjuster out. Sometimes it just goes straight through, but other times it gets real finicky and sometimes you end up with a frayed cable and stuff. So this is one of the cable ferrules that sits in the cable stop that's riveted to the frame. I don't really know why they did this style because that little bracket that's riveted to the frame, it doesn't actually have a stop inside it. It's just like a hose guide, basically. But tidying these up, I just use the drill just to spin it around against the red scotch bright pad and then just some auto sole again, just to polish them up a little bit. But they're quite porous and everything, so I'm not gonna go too hard. I'd have to sand them quite a bit to get them looking all beautiful again. So this rear cable, it didn't want to stay at the bend that I gave it. Um, so I just ended up cable tying it temporarily. I think it should take a bit of shape after a little while maybe. Uh, we'll see. So after that, one of the last things to do is to check the gears. So I'm setting it up friction. So basically you just have to set the high and low limit screws and then make sure that they're at a position where you can select all the gears. Then just doing the same for the front. Um, I actually forgot to set the high limit screw. So the chain chopped off, but just putting it back in a little bit more. It actually looks like the front derailleur could go down a little bit here. So I'll have to adjust that, but might have just been the camera angle. And this is the bike, how it turned out. I'm really happy with it. The pink against the polish looks really nice. It looks so good. So this is version two all done. I'm gonna take it for a bit of a ride as it is and then later on in the video I'll do a few modifications to it and show you sort of the end result so yeah oh, it looks so good yeah pink okay see you see you a bit later
bike always impresses me when I ride it off-road. On-road it's quick and everything as well, like it's quite a stiff bike, but it really seems to excel off-road. Um, every time I get on some trails, it, it just wants to just keep riding on trails, basically. Um, you can get the power down really nicely, and in the last video it seemed to be really surprising through the mud. I don't know how, but yeah. And it rips around corners and everything. With some different tyres, I think the Billy Bonkers would be really good on this, so I can commute on it, but I can still rip it off-road when I want to. But yeah, this bike is its really nice. <laughs> My dumb move. The rock. So I don't know if you heard that just then, but every now and then you still hear the chain slap. So the chain actually slaps up into the chain stay. Beautiful greenery. So unfortunately there wasn't too much mud to ride through this time around. But after this ride, it was pretty much time to do the modifications to it. I was just waiting on a couple of little things. Something else to note is that my calves sort of smack into the chainstays on this bike. Because they're quite wide. So some of the parts we'll be putting on the bike is this Miami Fade Charged Spoon Saddle. Some different pedals. A couple of different pedals. I didn't know which ones would look good on it. Um, ESI Chunky Grips and Billy Bonkers Tires. These are quite a nice all-round tread pattern. I haven't tried them before, but I've heard really good things about them. Also got the Crumbworks KT Handlebar. So Crumbworks is a bike store in Japan, and they designed a handlebar, which they had made by Nitto. So really good quality, and just a really cool style to it. Has a nice bit of rise, some good back sweep to it. And I think it's about 720 millimeters, so it's pretty good width too for commuting and some off-road riding too. Throwing on the ESI grips, I use a bit of isopropyl alcohol and just sort of squeeze them on. This is kind of tricky and getting them off is even harder. I've, I've torn quite a few ESI grips, but I really love the feel of them under my hand, so, so I've pretty much got them on all my bikes now. I haven't found anything that I like more. And I went with purple to go with some of the other parts on the bike. So it's got some purple bottle cages, the purple Polestar hubs, and just some other little bits and bobs. So changing out the seat now, this was a turbo saddle, which is a pretty, pretty well a classic. Um, a lot of people love these. They don't really suit me as well though. So the Charger Spoon I tried on the Alpine Stars and I really quite liked it. So I bought a brand new Miami Fade. That colorway is so cool. I still also really like the Brooks B17, but the Charge Spoon is a nice alternative. So changing out the tires now to the Billy Bonkers. 
I've heard really good things about them, so I'm looking forward to trying them out. I don't expect them to be as good through the mud and stuff, but don't care too much about that. Uh, <laughs> I'll just get sideways, that's fine. Um, they do have quite a nice supple feel to them as well, uh, but that's just compared to the old Panerasas that have gone pretty hard. So mounting a front basket, this is the style that I normally do, like a little adapter break it, but the dropout of the Alpine Stars, it, it has like a recess and it doesn't have an eyelet either, so it's not really ideal. And because it's steel, I suppose I could put a rib nut in the back side of the fork, but I decided to use hose clamps instead and see how that goes. Um, people have been using hose clamps to strap stuff to their bikes for ages, so not too worried about it. Just using a bit of steel plate at the top to sandwich the rack there. This is just a walled 137. It's quite a nice size for commuting and stuff. I've got a few things to adjust still, like the levers, shifters, and handlebar, I think. But this is how the bike turned out. I'm really happy with the look of it. It rides nicely. The bonkers are pretty quick. I haven't taken them like too far off-road yet. But yeah, thanks for checking the video out. I'll have a bit of a bit more feedback on the tyres and stuff in the future. So I'll just do like a bit of an update at some point. Really quick, if you're a subscriber, I'm sorry that this video took quite a while to get out. Um, it's been really busy around here and everything. So I hope you can sort of understand that. There definitely won't be as big of a gap between the next video and this one. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for checking it out. I really appreciate it and all the kind words and the feedback and everything. Yeah, thanks for hanging out and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye. so bright but you can see this stuff you can't even really see it <laughs> can you see that oh, yeah. that was my grief gun beautiful bike very beautiful bike <laughs>